This is Fred Johnson from Air Rail Images. As a B-24 Liberator historian for many years, this film is the best training film that I have found. I think you will find it very interesting and very diverse. Take a look. And if you have not already subscribed to the Air Rail Images channel, please do. We will continue to upload historical video as we acquire it. From Ployesh to Paramashiro, from France to the Philippines, makers of many of this war's headlines have been B-24 liberators and the men who fly and fight them. heroine two of many a wing and a prayer story. Flak gutted 24 brings back airmen. Lib beats off eight enemy fighters, comes home on two engines. To some people it sounds as if the Liberator comes home itself, while pilot and crew relax and enjoy the ride. To some people, but not to the pilot and crew. The men who flew safely back from battle in these planes know the B-24's ability to take punishment is only half the story. A good solid half, but the other half is know-how. It's the sum total of information you have about any plane that will determine whether you can bring it back after it has been badly shot up. Men who have piled up combat missions have said that if they had to do it all over, they'd spend more time during training learning their airplane from one end to the other. They know time invested that way pays off. How it pays off is shown in the following scenes, taken by combat camera crews during operations against the enemy in Europe and the Pacific. Only fuel supply limits the flying time of a B-24 on three engines and the many long-distance two-engine returns recorded in all theaters emphasize the effectiveness of procedures prescribed for maximum unbalanced power performance. If you have to feather, be sure you hit the right feathering button. Then fly your plane in a streamlined attitude, keeping needle and ball centered. Lower five degrees of flap for maximum lift and minimum drag, and hold airspeed between 140 and 145 miles an hour. 
However, if it's necessary to hold formation, higher speeds can be maintained without any difficulty. If number one or two engine is feathered, check your vacuum pump and turn select the valve to the good engine. But while this is sufficient in fair weather like this, if ice is encountered, have one of the crew periodically switch the selector valve from good to feathered engine to keep both de-icer and gyro equipment operating. It's a practice that pays off, as this pilot returning from Ludwigshafen can testify. Homeward bound from truck with number three flak hole. If this engine is feathered, remember it powers your hydraulic pump and you must use the auxiliary, opening the star valve to lower gear and flaps. Then close the star valve for brake pressure and come on in for a normal approach and landing. Like this one, ending a strike at Northern Italy. A three engine landing, simple as ABC. Whether it's one, two, three, or four, that's feathered. Evidence that even two engines provide ample directional control for a safe return is this landing in Yugoslavia with one and three feathered. And though it's not as hard to center the ball with one engine out on either side as it is with completely one-sided power loss, even three and four out are no reason for the excitement that caused this pilot to come in too hot. It's almost impossible to overshoot a properly handled 24. If you're high, chop off throttles, drop full flap, high RPM, and point the nose down. If too fast, chop off throttles, high RPM, and full flap, and you'll never barrel to the end of the runway like this. No brakes. Number three feathered and the auxiliary hydraulic system shattered over the Balkans. But it's no insurmountable problem to a pilot who knows his procedure. Before coming in, a chute is securely fastened just inside each waist window. And upon prearranged signal from the pilot, assigned men pull the ripcord simultaneously. Terrific loads thrown on the two chutes may, as in this case, tear one or both. Hence, if the only available runway is short, four chutes should be used. Pulling the first two, one from each waist window, as soon as the plane is well on the ground, the pilot should wait until airspeed drops below 100 miles an hour before signaling for release of the additional chutes which should stay intact at the reduced speed. Care should be employed in securing the chutes to plane as insurance against their tearing out waste gun mounts. The camera catches a pilot peeling off at Moratai for a belly landing demanded by a smashed hydraulic system and other damage that prevented manual lowering of the gear. And he's down, a 24 greased in on her belly by a skipper who knows the formula. Slow air speed to minimum and use full flaps. Pick a smooth hard surface, a runway if available, and make a normal approach and landing while the co-pilot reduces the danger of fire by cutting all mixture controls and ignition switches just after contact. A walkaway success, as a gear up landing should be for a pilot and crew who know their stuff. A 24 returning from a raid on WeWAC, being brought in with a retracted nose wheel and both inboards feathered. And there's an error here you should be watching for, but it only emphasizes how simple it is to do this right, for the right way is common sense. Have the crew in the Bombay catwalk, or just aft of the bulkhead, and then just after the main gear is on the runway, give them a signal to walk toward the tail. The landing's normal in all other respects except one. 
that one. Don't drop the nose like that. Ease her back on the tail skid. Weight of the crew members will maintain the tail down position, but they must stay aft until ground crews devise a nose support. Evidence at Enuitak that for an alert B-24 pilot and crew, blown out tires hold no hazards. The left main tire is flat. With main gear tire bullet ripped over Brunswick, another pilot places his nose wheel firmly on the ground holds direction by using his outboard engine and breaking his good wheel. The slight turn left is due to hitting soft ground. This is a reminder that the pilot should do all possible to keep his craft on a hard surface runway for maximum control. Important too is a point this pilot back from Ployest forgot. With right main tire shot and only number three to hold direction, he landed too near the center of the runway, leaving little room for veer due to lack of outboard power. An outboard engine feathered on the same side as a damaged tire requires an approach well to the side of the runway, away from the flat. With nose wheel firmly placed on the ground, brakes applied to the good wheel, and power shot to the engine on the flat side, sufficient control can be maintained to stay on a wide runway. In cases where the runway is narrow or obstructed, swerve may be entirely eliminated by shooting out the remaining good main gear tire. Ease with which a 24 can be brought in with a punctured nose wheel tire is evidenced here in the landing scarcely distinguishable from normal. The pilot took a chance at this point, however, by letting his nose wheel touch too soon. Absolute safety calls for holding the nose wheel off as long as possible, balancing the plane slightly tail heavy, using full elevator trim tab if necessary. Handling your plane in that manner guarantees the kind of landing this 15th Air Force pilot got the rabbit's foot way. Know-how and the toughness of the 24. Home after being flak blasted over Yugoslavia, this B-24 testified to what skill can do with a rugged aircraft. Back across the Adriatic with this plane torn almost in two by a shell that exploded inside the waist, shredding both rudder and elevator controls, the pilot maintained altitude and directional control, came safely back to base. Instantly, to this and to other good pilots, come the answers to such damage. Throw all excess weight overboard, slow airspeed to a minimum, get all crew members forward of the weak point, maintain direction by use of engines and undamaged controls, use trim tabs if intact, use the autopilot smoothly, and if rough weather is encountered, reduce airspeed and use the desired amount of flaps. Yes, these are men who know the value of knowing their plane. Victim of a freak accident, this 24 returns as proof of the way a pilot trained to handle standard difficulties can get the utmost in stamina, strength, and performance out of his plane to meet unexpected emergencies. Over Parma, Italy, another aircraft crossing beneath this 24 caught one vertical stabilizer on its nose. So violent was the impact that the stabilizer was pinned on this bomber's twin 50s. Flung out of control, the plane dropped from 21,000 to less than 2,000 feet before a pilot brought her out straight and level. Headed finally home, he had to pour on more power immediately to overcome the greatly increased drag created by the obstruction on the nose. A constant menace and challenge to his skill until the wheel stopped rolling here in Corsica, where, incidentally, even the nose gunner stepped out unhurt. The only film in this picture not shot under combat conditions are these scenes of a controlled experiment flown out of Langley Field, Virginia. Here included for the graphic tips they present on the rights and the wrongs of ditching a B-24. And the experimental plane is airborne, deliberately headed for a water landing. 
correctly made here for a slick surfaced sea, the standard approach and set down are into the wind. But remember, if the sea is rough, the landing should be made parallel to the wave crests. And here is the same landing photographed in slow motion for analytical study. With crew alerted and prepared to abandon aircraft the moment she comes to a complete stop, the skilled pilot will at this point have ordered the majority of his men to the command deck, the only part of the plane that will stay dry after contact with the water. The normal approach is continued using full flaps to decrease contact speed to the absolute minimum. And this level three point position should be maintained rather than lowering the tail as shown here before impact. The pilot and co-pilot who undertook this mission without a crew are picked up by the standby launch, safe after their experiment in the field of flying safety. You can take it from them and from every one of these men, pilots and crew members. When you take off, you want to be alert to every capability of your plane. You want to carry over the target such skill in emergency procedures that at the first touch of flak or fighter fire, you have the answer at your fingertips. Then you'll have what it takes to write a wing and a prayer story yourself, if you have to, not just a rugged plane that has proved she can take a lot of pounding, but the know-how to make her give all she's got and to help her bring you safely home.